Act One of The Inconstant by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Inconstant, a comedy in five acts by George Farquhar Esquire. Dramatis Personae. Old Mirabel, read by Todd. Young Mirabel, read by Thomas Peter. Captain Duratet, read by Craig Franklin. Dugar, read by Nemo. Petit, read by Eva Davis. First Bravo, read by Alan Mapstone. Second Bravo, read by Tavarish. Bravo Three, recorded by Chuck Williamson. Bravo Four, read by Son of the Exiles. Oriana, read by Lianya. Bizarre, read by Sonia. Lamours, read by Rapunzelina. Page, read by Sandra. Lady, read by Avai. Stage directions, read by Kalinda. Act the First, Scene One, The Street. Enter Dugard and his man Petit, in riding habits. Sirrah, what's o'clock? Turned of eleven, sir. No more. We have rid a swinging pace from Nemours since two this morning. Petit, run to Rousseau's and bespeak a dinner at a Louis d'Or ahead to be ready by one. How many will there be of you, sir? Let me see. Mirabel one, Duetet two, myself three, and I four. How now, sir? At your old travelling familiarity, when abroad you had some freedom for want to better company, but among my friends at Paris, pray remember your distance. Be gone, sir. Exit, Petit. This fellow's wit was necessary abroad, but he's too cunning for a domestic. I must dispose of him some way else. Who's here? Old Mirabel and my sister, my dearest sister. Enter old Mirabel and Oriana. My brother, welcome. Monsieur Mirabel. I'm heartily glad to see you. Honest, Mr. Degard, by the blood of the Mirabelles, I'm your most humble servant. Why, sir, you've cast your skin. Sure, you're brisk and gay. Lusty health about you, no sign of age, but your silver hairs. Silver hairs? Then they are quick silver hairs, sir. Whilst I have golden pockets, let my hairs be silver, and they will. Odds bud, sir, I can dance and sing and drink and... No, I can't, wench. But, Mr. de Gard, no news of my son Bob in all your travels? Your son's come home, sir. Come home? Bob come home? By the blood of the Mirabelles, Mr. de Gard, what say you? Mr. Mirabel returns, sir. He's certainly come, and you may see him within this hour or two. Swear it, Mr. Degard. Presently swear it. Sir, he came to town with me this morning. I left him at the Bonniere, being a little disordered after riding, and I shall see him again presently. What? And he was ashamed to ask a blessing with his boots on? A nice dog! Well, and how fares the young rogue, huh? A fine gentleman, sir. He'll be his own messenger. A fine gentleman? But is the rogue like me still? Why, yes, sir. He's very like his mother, and is like you, as most modern sons are to their fathers. Why, sir, don't you think that I begat him? Why, yes, sir. You married his mother and he inherits your estate. He's very like you, upon my word. And pray, brother, what's become of his honest companion, Duratet? Who? The captain? The very same. He went abroad. 
he's the only frenchman i ever knew that could not change your son mr mirabel is more obliged to nature for that fellow's composition than for his own for he's more happy in duetet's folly than his own wit in short they are as inseparable as finger and thumb but the first instance in the world i believe of opposition in friendship very well will he be home to dinner think ye sir he has ordered me to bespeak a dinner for us at rousseau's at a louis d'or ahead a louis d'or ahead well said bob by the blood of the mirabelles bob's improved but mr dugard was it so civil of bob to visit monsieur rousseau before his own natural father eh hark ye oriana what think you now of a fellow that can eat and drink ye a whole louis d'or at a sitting he must be as strong as hercules life and spirit in abundance before gad i don't wonder at these men of quality that their own wives can't serve them a louis d'or a head tis enough to stock the whole nation with bastards tis faith mr de guard i leave you with your sister exit well sister i need not ask you how you do your looks resolve me fair tall well shaped you're almost grown out of my remembrance why truly brother i look pretty well thank nature and my toilet i eat three meals a day and very merry when up and sleep soundly when i'm down but sister you remember that upon my going abroad you would choose this old gentleman for your guardian he's no more related to our family than prester john and i have no reason to think you mistrusted my management of your fortune therefore pray be so kind as to tell me without reservation the true cause of making such a choice look ye brother you are going a rambling and was proper lest i should go a rambling too that somebody should take care of me old monsieur mirabel as an honest gentleman was our father's friend and has a young lady in his house whose company i like and who has chosen him for her guardian as well as i who mademoiselle bizarre the same we live merrily together without scandal or reproach we make much of the old gentleman between us and he takes care of us all the week we dance and sing and upon sundays go first to church and then to the play now brother besides these motives for choosing this gentleman for my guardian perhaps i had some private reasons not so private as you imagine sister your love to young metabel's no secret i can assure you but so public that all your friends are ashamed aunt oh my word then my friends are very bashful though i'm afraid sir that those people are not ashamed enough for their own crimes who have so many blushes to spare for the faults of their neighbours eh but sister the people say pshaw hang the people they'll talk treason and profane their maker must we therefore infer that our king is a tyrant and religion a cheat look ye brother their court of inquiry is a tavern and their informer claret they think as they drink and swallow their reputations like a lush a lady's health goes briskly around at the glass but her honour is lost in the toast ay but sister there is still something if there be something brother tis none of the people something marriage is my thing and i'll stick to it marriage young mirabel marry he'll build churches sooner take heed sister though your honour stood proof to his homebred assaults you must keep a stricter guard for the future he has now got the foreign air and the italian softness his wits improved by converse his behaviour finished by observation and his assurances confirmed by success sister i can assure you he has made his conquest and tis a plague upon your sex to be the soonest deceived by those very men that you know have been false to others but then sister he's as fickle for god's sake brother tell me no more of his faults 
for if ye do, I shall run mad for him. Say no more, sir. Let me but get him into the bands of matrimony. I'll spoil his wandering, I warrant him. I'll do his business that way, never fear. Well, sister, I won't pretend to understand the engagements between you and your lover. I expect when you have need of my counsel or assistance, you will let me know more of your affairs. Mirabel is a gentleman, and as far as my honor and interest can reach, you may command me to the furtherance of your happiness. In the meantime, sister, I have a great mind to make you a present of another humble servant, a fellow that I took up at Lyon, who has served me honestly ever since. Then why will you part with him? He has gained so insufferably on my good humor that he's grown too familiar. But the fellow's cunning and may be serviceable to you in your affair with Mirabel. Here he comes. Enter Petit. Well, sir, have you been at Rousseau's? Yes, sir. And who should I find there but Mr. Mirabel and the captain, hatching as warmly over a tub of ice as two hen pheasants over a brood. They would not let me bespeak anything, for they had dined before I came. Come, sir, you shall serve my sister. I shall still continue kind to you, and if your lady recommends your diligence upon trial, I'll use my interest to advance you. Wait on your lady home, Petit. Exit. A chair, a chair, a chair. No, no, I'll walk home. Tis by next door. Exit. Scene two. A tavern. Young Mirabel and Duartet discovered, rising from table. Welcome to Paris once more, my dear captain. We have ate heartily, drank roundly, paid plentifully, and let it go for once. I liked everything but our women. They looked so lean and tawdry, poor creatures. To the sure sign the army is not paid. Give me the plum Venetian, brisk and sanguine. That smiles upon me like the glowing sun, and meets my lips like sparkling wine, her person shining as the glass, in spirit like the foaming liquor. Ah, Mirabel, Italy, I grant you. But for our women here in France, they are such thin, brawn, fallen jades, a man may as well make a bedfellow of a cane chair. France, ah, a light, unseasoned country. Nothing but feathers, foppery, and fashions. There's nothing on this side of the Alps worth my humble service, Che. Ha! Roma la Santa. Italy for my money. Their customs, gardens, buildings, paintings, music, policies, wine, and women. The paradise of the world. Not pestered with a parcel of precise, old, gouty fellows that would debar their children every pleasure that they themselves are past the sense of. Commend me to the Italian familiarity. Here, son, there's fifty crowns. Go, pay your girl her week's allowance. Aye, these are your fathers for you that understand the necessities of young men, not like our musty dads who, because they cannot fish themselves, would muddy the water and spoil the sport of them that can. But now, you talk of the plump. What do you think of a Dutchwoman? Oh, a Dutch woman's too compact. Nay, <laughs> everything among them is so. A Dutch man is thick. A Dutch woman is squab. A Dutch horse is round. A Dutch dog is short. A Dutch ship is broad-bottomed. And in short, one would swear that the whole product of the country were cast in the same mould with their cheeses. Aye, but Mirabel, you have forgotten the English ladies. The women of England were excellent. Do they not take such insufferable pains to ruin what nature has made so incomparably well? They would be delicate creatures indeed, could they but thoroughly arrive at the French mean, or entirely let it alone. For they only spoil a very good air of their own by an awkward imitation of ours. But come, Dertet, let us mind the business in hand. Mistresses we must have, and must take up with the manufacture of the place, and upon a competent diligence we shall find those in Paris shall match the Italians from top to toe. 
ay mirabel you will do well enough but what will become of your friend you know i am so plaguy bashful so naturally an ass upon these occasions that ah you must be bolder man travel three years and bring home such a baby as bashfulness a great lusty fellow and a soldier fie upon it looky sir i can visit and i can ogle a little as thus or thus now then i can kiss abundantly but if they chance to give me a forbidding look as some women you know have a devilish cast with their eyes or if they cry what do you mean what do you take me for fie sir remember who i am sir a person of quality to be used at this rate egad i'm struck as flat as a frying-pan words of course never mind them turn you about upon your heel with a jante air hum out the end of an old song cut across caper and at her again dortet imitates him no hang it twill never do Oakens, what did my father mean by sticking me up in a university or to think that i should gain anything by my head in a nation whose genius lies all in their heels well if ever i come to have children my own they shall have the education of the country they shall learn to dance before they can walk and be taught to sing before they can speak come come throw off that childish humour put on assurance there's no avoiding it stand all hazards thou to stout lusty fellow and hast a good estate look bluff hector you have a good side-box face a pretty impudent face so that's pretty well hm, this fellow went abroad like an ox and has returned like an ass let me see now how i look pulls out a pocket glass and looks on it a side-box face say you egad i don't like it mirabel fie sir don't abuse your friends i could not wear such a face for the best countess in christendom why can't you blockhead as well as i why thou hast impudence to set a good face upon anything i would change half my gold for half thy brass with all my heart who comes here also mirabel your father enter old mirabel where's bob dear bob your blessing sir my blessing damn ye ye young rogue why did not you come to see your father first sirrah my dear boy i am heartily glad to see thee my dear child in faith captain de tate by the blood of the mirabelles i'm yours well my lads ye look bravely in faith bob hast got any money left not a farthing sir why then i won't give thee a sous <laughs> i did but jest here's ten pistols why then here's ten more i love to be charitable to those that don't want it well and how do you like italy my boys oh in the garden of the world sir rome naples venice milan and a thousand others oh all fine i say you so and they say that chiari is very fine too indifferent sir very indifferent a very scurvy air the most unwholesome to a french constitution in the world pshaw nothing on it these rascally gazetteers have misinformed you misinformed me on oh, sir were we not beaten there beaten sir we beaten why how was it pray sweet sir uh, sir the captain will tell you no sir your son will tell you the captain was in the action sir your son saw more than i sir for he was a looker-on confound you both for a brace of cowards here are no germans to overhear you why don't you tell me how it was why then you must know that we marched a, a body of the finest bravest well-dressed fellows in the universe our commanders at the head of us all lace and feather like so many bow at a ball i don't believe there was a man of them but could dance a charmer mon bleu. dance very well pretty fellows in faith we capered up to the very trenches and there saw peeping over a parcel of scarecrow all of coloured 
gunpowder fellows as ugly as the devil. Egad, I shall never forget the looks of them while I have breath to fetch. They were so civil indeed as to welcome us with their cannon, but for the rest we found them such unmannerly, rude, unsociable dogs that we grew tired of their company, so we e'en danced back again. And did ye all come back? No, uh, two or three thousand of us stayed behind. Why, Bob? Why? Pshaw, because they could not come that night. No, sir, because they could not come that night. But come, sir, we were talking of something else. Pray, how does your lovely charge, the fair Oriana? Ripe, sir, just ripe. You'll find it better engaging with her than with the Germans, let me tell you. And what would you say, my young Mars, if I had a Venus for thee, too? Come, Bob, your apartment is ready, and pray let your friend be my guest, too. You shall command the house between ye, and I'll be as merry as the best of you. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of The Inconstant by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Second, Scene One Old Mirabel's House. Oriana and Bissar. And you love this young rake, do you? Yes. In spite of all his ill usage? I can't help it. What's the matter with you? Pshh! Oh, before that any young, lying, swearing, flattering, rakehelly fellow should play such tricks with me, oh, the devil take all your Cassandras and Cleopatras for me. I warrant now you'll play the fool when he comes, and say you love him, eh? Most certainly. I can't dissemble, Bissor. Besides, tis past that, we're contracted. Contracted? Alack a day, poor thing! What, you have changed rings, or broken an old broadpiece between you? I would make a fool of any fellow in France. Well, I must confess, I do love a little coquetting, with all my heart. My business should be to break gold with my lover one hour, and crack my promise the next. He should find me one day with a prayer book in my hand, and with a playbook another. He should have my consent to buy the wedding ring, and the next moment... Would I ask him his name? Oh, my dear, were there no greater tie upon my heart than there is upon my conscience, I would soon throw the contract out of doors. But the mischief, aunt, is, I am so fond of being tied that I am forced to be just, and the strength of my passion keeps down the inclination of my sex. But here's the old gentleman. Enter old Mirabel. Where's my wenches? Where's my two little girls? Eh? Hey! Have a care. Look to yourselves, in faith. They're a-comin', the travellers are a-comin'. Well, which of you two will be my daughter-in-law now? Bizarre, bizarre? What say you, madcap? Mirabel is a pure, wild fellow. I like him the worse. You lie, hussy. You like him the better. Indeed you do. What say you, my other little filbert, eh? I suppose the gentleman would choose for himself, sir. Why, that's discreetly said, and so he shall. Enter Mirabel and Dortet. They salute the ladies. Bob, hark ye, you shall marry one of these girls, sir. Da. Sir, I'll marry them both, if you please. Bizarre aside. He'll find that one may serve his turn. Both? Why, you young dog, do you banter me? Come, sir, take your choice. De Tate, you shall have your choice, too. But Robin shall choose first. Come, sir, begin. Well, which do you like? Both. But which will you marry? Neither. Neither? Don't make me angry now, Bob. Pray, don't make me angry. Look ye, sirrah, if I don't dance at your wedding tomorrow... I shall be very glad to cry at your grave. That's a bull, father. A bull? Why, how now, ungrateful sir? Did I make thee a man that thou shouldst make me a beast? Your pardon, sir. 
I only meant your expression. Harky, Bob. Learned better manners to your father before strangers. I won't be angry this time. But hoons, if ever you do it again, you rascal, remember what I say. Exit. Psha! What does the old fellow mean by mewing me up here with a couple of green girls? Come, dear tete, will you go? I hope, Mr. Mirabeau, you had forgot. No, no, madam, I had not forgot. I have brought you a thousand little Italian curiosities. I'll assure you, madam, as far as a hundred pistoles would reach, I had not forgot the least circumstance. Sir, you misunderstand me. Ought so. The relics, madam, from Rome. I do remember now you made a vow of chastity before my departure. A vow of chastity or something like it. Was it not, madam? Oh, sir, I am answered at present. Exit. She was coming full mouth upon me with her contract. But I might dispatch a t'other. Mirabel, that lady there, observe her. She's wondrous pretty faith, and seems to have but few words. I like her mainly. Speak to her, man, prithee, speak to her. Madam, he was a gentleman who declares. Madam, don't believe him. I declare nothing. What the devil do you mean, man? He says, madam, that you are as beautiful as an angel. He tells a damn lie, madam. I say no such thing. Are you mad, Mirabel? Why, I shall drop down with shame. And so, madam, not doubting but your ladyship may like him as well as he does you, I think it proper to leave you together. Going, Duretet holds him. Hold, hold, why, Mirabel, friend, sure you won't be so barbarous as to leave me alone. Prithee, speak to her for yourself, as it were. Lord, Lord, that a Frenchman should want impudence. You look mighty demure, madam. She's deaf, Captain. I had much rather have her dumb. The gravity of your air, madam, promises some extraordinary fruits from your study, which moves us with curiosity to inquire the subject of your ladyship's contemplation. Oh, not a word. I hope in the Lord she's speechless. If she be, she is mine this moment. Mirabel, do you think a woman's silence can be natural? But the forms which logicians introduce, and which proceed from simple enumeration, are dubitable and proceed only upon admittance. Hoity-toity! What a plague have we here! Plato in petticoats! Ay, ay, let her go on, man. She talks in my own mother tongue. This exposed to invalidity from a contradictory instance, looks only upon common operations, and is infinite in its termination. Rare pedantry! Axioms, axioms! self-evident principles then the ideas wherewith the mind is preoccupied oh gentlemen i hope you pardon my cogitation i was involved in a profound point of philosophy but i shall discuss it somewhere else being satisfied that the subject is not agreeable to your sparks that profess the vanity of the times exit go thy way good wife bias do you hear Dotet? Dost hear this starched piece of austerity? She's mine, man, she's mine. My own talent to a T. I'll match her in dialectics. Faith, I was seven years at the university, man. Nursed up with Barbaro, Celerant, Darry, Ferio, Barolipton. Did you ever know, man, that twas metaphysics made me an ass? It was, faith. Had she talked a word of singing, dancing, plays, fashions, or the like, I had found it at the first step. But as she is, Mirabel, wish me joy. <gasps> you don't mean marriage, I hope. No, no, I am a man of more honour. Bravely resolved, Captain. Now for thy credit, warm me this frozen snowball. Twill be a conquest above the Alps. But will you promise... To be always near me? Upon all occasions, never fear. Why then, you shall see me in two moments make an induction from my love to her hand, from her hand to her mouth, from her mouth to her heart, and so conclude in her bed. Categorimatis. Now the game begins, and my fool is entered. 
But here comes one to spoil my sport. Now shall I be teased to death with his old-fashioned contract. I should love her too if I might do it my own way. But she'll do nothing without witnesses, forsooth. I wonder women can be so immodest. Enter Oriana. Well, madam, why do you follow me? Well, sir, why do you shun me? Tis my humour, madam, and I'm naturally swayed by inclination. Have you forgot her contract, sir? All I remember of that contract is that it was made some three years ago, and that's enough in conscience to forget the rest on't. Tis sufficient, sir, to recollect the passing of it, for in that circumstance, I presume, lies the force of the obligation. Obligations, madam, that are forced upon the will, are no tie upon the conscience. I was a slave to my passion when I passed the instrument, but the recovery of my freedom makes the contract void. Come, Mr. Mirabel, these expressions are expected from the raillery of your humour, but I hope for very different sentiments from your honour and generosity. Look ye, madam, as for my generosity, it is at your service with all my heart. I'll keep you a coach and six horses if you please. Only permit me to keep my honour to myself. Consider, madam, you have no such thing among ye, and tis the main point of policy to keep no faith with reprobates. Thou art a pretty little reprobate, and so get thee about thy business. Well, sir, even all this I will allow to the gaiety of your temper. Your travels have improved your talent of talking, but they are not a force, I hope, to impair your morals. Morals? Oh, why, there tis again now. I tell thee, child, there is not the least occasion for morals in any business between you and I. Don't you know that, of all commerce in the world, there is no such causinage and deceit as in the traffic between man and woman? We study all our lives long how to put tricks upon one another. No fowler lays abroad more nets for his game, nor a hunter for his prey, than you do to catch poor, innocent men. Why do you sit three or four hours at your toilet in the morning? Only with a villainous design to make some poor fellow a fool before night? What do you sigh for? What do you weep for? What do you pray for? Why, for a husband. That is, you implore Providence to assist you in the just, impious design of making the wisest of his creatures a fool, and the head of the creation a slave. Sir, I am proud of my power, and am resolved to use it. Hold, hold, madam, not so fast. So you have a variety of vanities to make coxcombs of us. So we have vows, oaths, and protestations, of all sorts and sizes, to make fools of you. And this, in short, my dear creature, is our present condition. I have sworn and lied briskly to gain my ends of you. Your ladyship is patched and painted violently to gain your ends of me. But since we are both disappointed, let us make a drawn battle and part clear on both sides. With all my heart, sir, give me up my contract and I'll never see your face again. Indeed, I won't, child. What, sir? Neither do one nor to the other. No. You shall die a maid, unless you please to be otherwise, upon my terms. What do you intend by this, sir? Why, to starve you into compliance. Looky, you shall never marry any man, and you had as good let me do you a kindness as a stranger. Sir, you're a... What am I, ma'am? A villain, sir. <clears throat> I'm glad on't. I never knew an honest fellow in my life, but was a villain upon these occasions. And you drawn yourself now into a very pretty dilemma. <laughs> the poor lady has made a vow of virginity when she thought of making a vow to the contrary. Was ever poor woman so cheated into chastity? Sir, my fortune is equal to yours. My friends as powerful, and both shall be put to the test, to do me justice. What? You'll force me to marry you, will ye? Sir... The law shall. But the law can't force me to do anything else, can it? Pshaw! I despise thee! Monster! Oh, kiss me, friends, then. Don't cry, child, and you shall have your sugar plum. Come, madam, do you think I could be so unreasonable as to make you fast all your life long? No, I did but jest. You shall have your liberty. Here, take your contract, and give me mine. No, I won't. Eh? What? Is the girl a fool? No, sir. You shall find me cunning enough to do myself justice. And since I must not depend upon your love, I'll be revenged and force you to marry me out of spite. Then I'll beat thee out of spite and make a most confounded husband. 
Oh, sir, I shall match ye. A good husband makes a good wife at any time. I'll rattle down your china about your ears. And I'll rattle about the city to run you in debt for more. Ah, I'll tear the fur below of your clothes, and when you swoon for vexation, you shan't have a penny to buy a bottle of hartshorn. And you, sir, shall have hartshorn in abundance. I'll keep as many mistresses as I have coach horses. And I'll keep as many gallants as you have grooms. But, sweet madam, there is such a thing as divorce. But, sweet sir, there is such a thing as alimony. So divorce on, and spare not. Exit. Ay, that separate maintenance is the devil. There's their refuge. Oh, my conscience. One would take cuckoldom for a meritorious action, because the women are so handsomely rewarded for it. Exit. Enter Dortet and Petite. And she's mighty peevish, you say? Oh, sir, she has a tongue as long as my leg, and talks so crabbedly, you would think she always spoke Welsh. That's an odd language, methinks, for her philosophy. But sometimes she will sit you half a day without speaking a word, and talk oracles all the while by the wrinkles of her forehead and the motions of her eyebrows. Nay, I shall match her in philosophical ogles. Faith, that's my talent. I can talk best, you must know, when I say nothing. But do you ever laugh, sir? Laugh? Won't she endure laughing? Why, she's a critic, sir. She hates a jest for fear it should please her. And nothing keeps her in humour but what gives her the spleen. And then, for logic, and all that, you know. Aye, aye, I'm prepared. I have been practising hard words and no sense this hour to entertain her. Then place yourself behind this screen, that you may have a view of her behaviour before you begin. I long to engage her, lest I should forget my lesson. Here she comes, sir. I must fly. Exit Petite. And Dortat stands peeping behind the curtain. Enter Bizarre and Maid. Bizarre with a book. Psha! Hang books. They sour our temper, spoil our eyes, and ruin our complexions. Throws away the book. Eh? The devil such a word there is in all Aristotle. Come, wench. Let's be free. Call in the fiddle. There's nobody near us. Would to the Lord there was not. Here, friend, a minuet. Music. Quicker time. <laughs> Would we had a man or two? Dortet, stealing away. You shall have the devil sooner, my dear dancing philosopher. That's my life. He is one. Runs to Dortet and hails him back. Is all my learned preparation come to this? Come, sir, don't be ashamed. That's my good boy. You're very welcome. We wanted such a one. Come, strike up. Dance. I know you dance well, sir. You're finely shaped for it. Come, come, sir. Quick, quick. You missed the time, else. But, madam, I come to talk with you. Aye, aye. Talk as you dance. Talk as you dance. Come. But we were talking of dialectics. <laughs> Hang dialectics. Music. Mind the time. Quicker, Sarah. Come. <laughs> and how do you find yourself now, sir? In a fine breathing sweat, doctor. All the better, patient. All the better. Come, sir. Sing now. Sing. I know you sing well. I see you have a singing face. A heavy, dull sonata face. Who? I sing? Oh, you're modest, sir. But come. Sit down closer closer here a bottle of wine exit maid and returns with wine come sir sing sir but madam i came to talk with you oh sir you shall drink first come fill me a bumper here sir bless the king would i were out of his dominions by this light she'll make me drunk too oh pardon me sir you shall do me right fill it higher now, sir, can you drink a health under your leg? Rare philosophy, that, Faith. Come, 
off with it to the bottom <laughs> now how do you like me sir oh mighty well madam you see how a woman's fancy varies sometimes splenetic and heavy then gay and frolicsome and how do you like the humour good madam let me sit down to answer you for i am heartily tired fie upon it a young man and tired up for shame and walk about action becomes us a little faster sir what do you think now of my lady la pale and lady coquette the duke's fair daughter <laughs> are they not brisk lasses then there is black mrs belair and brown mrs belface they are all strangers to me madam but let me tell you sir that brown is not always despicable oh lard sir if young mrs bagatelle had kept herself single till this time o day what a beauty there had been and then you know the charming mrs monkey love the fair gem of st germain's upon my soul i don't and then you must have heard of the english beau spleenamore how unlike a gentleman hey not a syllable on't as i hope to be saved madam no <laughs> why then play me a jig music <laughs> come sir by this light i cannot faith madam i have sprained my leg then sit you down sir and now tell me what's your business with me what's your errand quick quick dispatch odd so may be you are some gentleman's servant that has brought me a letter or a haunch of venison it's death madam do i look like a carrier <laughs> cry you mercy i saw you just now i mistook you upon my word you are one of the travelling gentlemen and pray sir how do all our impudent friends in italy madam i came to wait on you with a more serious intention than your entertainment has answered sir your intention of waiting on me was the greatest affront imaginable however your expressions may turn it to a compliment your visit sir was intended as a prologue to a very scurvy play of which mr mirabel and you so handsomely laid the plot mary no no i am a man of more honour where's your honour where's your courage now adds my life sir i have a great mind to kick you go go to your fellow rake now rail at my sex and get drunk for vexation and ride a lampoon but i must have you to know sir that my reputation is above the scandal of a libel my virtue is sufficiently approved to those whose opinion is my interest and for the rest let them talk what they will for when i please i'll be what i please in spite of you and all mankind and so my dear man of honour if you be tired con over this lesson and sit there till i come to you <laughs> runs off Tundy dum ha 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 eds my life i have a good mind to kick you wounds and confusion starts up was ever man so abused eh mirabel set me on enter petite well sir how do ye find yourself ye you son of a nine-eyed whore do you come to abuse me i'll kick you with a vengeance ye dog Petite runs off, and Dortet after him. End of Act Two Act Three of The Inconstant by George Farquhar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Third, Scene One Old Mirabel's house. Enter old and young Mirabel meeting. Bob, come hither, Bob. Your pleasure, sir. Are not you a great rogue, sirrah? That's a little out of my comprehension, sir, for I've heard say that I resemble my father. Your father is your very humble slave. I tell thee what, child, thou art a very pretty fellow, and I love thee heartily, and a very great villain and i hate thee mortally villain sir then i must be a very impudent one for i can't recollect any passage of my life that i am ashamed of come hither my dear friend 
Dost see this picture? Shows him a little picture. Orianus? Pshaw! What, sir? Won't you look upon it? Bob, dear Bob, prithee come hither now. Dost want any money, child? No, sir. Why, then, here's some for thee. Come here now. How canst thou be so hard-hearted, an unnatural, unmannerly rascal? Don't mistake me, child. I aren't angry. As to abuse this tender, lovely, good-natured, dear rogue. Why, she sighs for thee, and cries for thee, pouts for thee, and snubs for thee. The poor little heart of it is like to burst. Come, my dear boy, be good-natured like your own father be now. And then, see here, read this. The effigies of the lovely Oriana, with thirty thousand pound to her portion. Thirty thousand pound, you dog. Thirty thousand pound, you rogue. How dare you refuse a woman with thirty thousand pound, you impudent rascal? Will you hear me speak, sir? Hear you speak, sir? If you had thirty thousand tongues, you could not out-talk thirty thousand pound, sir. Nay, sir, if you won't hear me, I'll be gone, sir. I'll take post for Italy this moment. Ah, the fellow knows I won't part with him. Well, sir, what have you to say? The universal reception, sir, that marriage has had in the world is enough to fix it for a public good and to draw everybody into the common cause. For there are some constitutions, like some instruments, so peculiarly singular that they make tolerable music by themselves, but never do well in a concert. Why, this is the reason, I must confess. But yet it is nonsense, too. For though you should reason like an angel, if you argue yourself out of a good estate, you talk like a fool. But, sir, if you bribe me into bondage with the riches of Croesus, you leave me but a beggar for want of my liberty. Was ever such a perverse fool heard? Sadeth, sir, why did I give you an education? Was it to dispute me out of my senses? Of what color now is the head of this cane? You'll say, tis white, and ten to one make me believe it, too. I thought that young fellows studied to get money. No, sir, I have studied to despise it. My reading was not to make me rich, but happy, sir. There he has me again, now. But, sir, did not I marry to oblige you? To oblige me, sir? In what respect, pray? Why, to bring you into the world, sir. Wasn't that an obligation? And because I would have it still an obligation, I avoid marriage. How is that, sir? Because I would not curse the hour I was born. Looky, friend. You may persuade me out of my designs, but I'll command you out of yours. And though you may convince my reason that you are in the right, yet there is an old attendant of sixty-three, called Positiveness, which you, nor all the wits in Italy, shall ever be able to shake. So, sir, you're a wit, and I'm a father. You may talk, but I'll be obeyed. This it is to have the son a finer gentleman than the father. They first give us breeding that they don't understand. Then they turn us out of doors, because we are wiser than themselves. But I am a little apprehend with the old gentleman. Sir, you have been pleased to settle a thousand pounds sterling a year upon me, in return of which I have a very great honour for you and your family, and shall take care that your only and beloved son shall do nothing to make him hate his father, or to hang himself. So, dear sir, I am your very humble servant." runs off. Here, sirrah, rogue, bob, villain. Enter Dugard. Ah, sir, tis but what he deserves. Tis false, sir. He don't deserve it. What have you to say against my boy, sir? I shall only repeat your own words. What have you to do with my words? I have swallowed my words already. I have eaten them up. I say that Bob's an honest fellow, and who dares deny it? Enter Bizarre. That there I, sir. I say that your son is a wild, foppish, whimsical, impertinent coxcomb, and where I abused as this gentleman's sister is, 
I would make it an Italian quarrel, and poison the whole family. Come, sir, tis no time for trifling. My sister is abused. You are made sensible of the affront, and your honour is concerned to see her redressed. Looky, Mr. Degard, good words go farthest. I will do your sister justice, but it must be after my own rate. Nobody must abuse my son but myself. For although Robin be a sad dog, yet he's nobody's puppy but my own. Aye, that's my sweet-natured, kind old gentleman. Wheedling him. We will be good, then, if you'll join with us in the plot. Ah, you coaxing young baggage! What plot can you have to wheedle a fellow of sixty-three? A plot that sixty-three is only good for to bring other people together, sir. You must act the Spaniard, because your son will least suspect you, and if he should, your authority protects you from a quarrel to which Oriana is unwilling to expose her brother. And what part will you act in the business, madam? Myself, sir. My friend is grown a perfect changeling. These foolish hearts of ours spoil our heads presently. The fellows no sooner turn knaves, but we turn fools but I am still myself, and he may expect the most severe usage from me, because I neither love him nor hate him. Exit. Well said, Mrs. Paradox. But, sir, who must open the matter to him? Petit, sir, who is our engineer general? And here he comes. Enter Petit. Oh, sir, more discoveries. Are all friends about us? Ay, ay, speak freely. You must know, sir. Oh, it's my life. I'm out of breath. You must know, sir. You must know. What the devil must we know, sir? That I have... Pants and blows. Bribed, sir. Bribed. Your son's secretary of state. Secretary of state? Who's that, for heaven's sake? His valet de chambre, sir? You must know, sir, that the intrigue lay folded up in his master's clothes, and when he went to dust the embroidered suit, the secret flew out of the right pocket of his coat. In a whole swarm of your crambo songs, short-footed oaths, and long-legged pindarics. Impossible! Ah, sir, he has loved her all along. There was Oriana in every line. But he hates marriage. Now, sir, this plot will stir up his jealousy, and we shall know, by the strength of that, how to proceed farther. Come, sir, let's about it with speed. Tis expedition gives our king this way, for expedition to the French give way, swift to attack, or swift to run away. Exeunt. Enter young Mirabel and Bizarre, passing carelessly by one another. Bizarre, aside. I wonder what she can see in this fellow to like him. Young Mirabel, aside. I wonder what my friend can see in this girl to admire her. A wild, foppish, extravagant rake hell. A light, whimsical, impertinent madcap. Whom do you mean, sir? Whom do you mean, madam? A fellow that has nothing left to re-establish him for a human creature, but a prudent resolution to hang himself. There is a way, madam, to force me to that resolution. I'll do it with all my heart. Then you must marry me. Look ye, sir, don't think your ill manners to me shall excuse your ill usage of my friend, nor by fixing a quarrel here to divert my zeal for the absent. For I am resolved, nay, I come prepared, to make you a panegyric that shall mortify your pride like any modern dedication. And I, madam, like a true modern patron, shall hardly give you thanks for your trouble. Come, sir, to let you see what little foundation you have for your dear sufficiency, I'll take you to pieces. And what piece will you choose? Your heart, to be sure, because I should get presently rid on it. Your courage I would give to a Hector, your wit to a lewd playmaker. 
your honour to an attorney, your body to the physicians, and your soul to its master. I had the oddest dream last night of the Duchess of Burgundy. Methought the furbelows of her gown were pinned up so high behind that I could not see her head for her tail. Oh, the creature don't mind me. Do you think, sir, that your humorous impertinence can divert me? No, sir, I'm above any pleasure that you can give but that of seeing you miserable. And mark me, sir, my friend, my injured friend, shall yet be doubly happy, and you shall be a husband as much as the rights of marriage and the breach of them can make you. Here Mirabel pulls out a Virgil and reads to himself while she speaks. Reading. Atregino dulos quis fallare posset amantem, dissimulare etiam sperasti perfide tantum. Very true. Posse nefas. <laughs> By your favour, friend Virgil, it was but a rascally trick of your hero to forsake poor Pug so inhumanly. I don't know what to say to him. The devil! What's Virgil to us, sir? Very much, madam, the most apropos in the world. For what should I chop upon but the very place where the perjured rogue of a lover and the forsaken lady are battling at tooth and nail? Come, madam, spend your spirits no longer. We'll take an easier method. I'll be Aeneas now, and you shall be Dido, and we'll rail by book. Now for you, madam Dido. Nec te noster amor, nec te data dextera quondam, nec moritura tenet crudeli funere dido. Ah, poor Dido. Looking at her. Rudeness, affronts, impatience. Oh, I could almost start out, even to manhood, and want but a weapon as long as his to fight him upon the spot. What shall I say? <gasps> now she rants. Why quibus antiferam? Yam yam nec maxima juno. A man? No, the woman's birth was spirited away. Right, right, madam, the very words. Perfide. And some pernicious elf left in the cradle. With human shape to palliate growing mischief. Go, sir, fly to your midnight revels. Excellent. Isequere talium Converse with ventis, imps of darkness of your make. Undas, your nature starts at justice si and shivers at the touch of virtue. Oh, now the devil take his impudence. He vexes me so, I don't know whether to cry or laugh at him. Ha! Bravely performed, my dear Libyan. I'll write the tragedy of Dido, and you shall act the part. But you do nothing at all unless you fret yourself into a fit, for here the poor lady is stifled with vapours, drops into the arms of her maids, and the cruel, barbarous, deceitful wanderer is, in the very next line, called Pious Aeneas. There's authority for you. Sorry indeed Aeneas stood to see her in a pout, but Jove himself, who ne'er thought good to stay a second bout, commands him off with all his crew, and leaves poor Di, as I leave you. Runs off. <laughs> Go thy ways for a dear, mad, deceitful, agreeable fellow. <laughs> On my conscience, I must excuse Oriana. That lover soon his angry fair disarms, whose slighting pleases, and whose faults are charms. Exit. Enter Petite, runs about to every door and knocks. Mr. Mirabel. Sir, where are you? Nowhere to be found. Enter young Mirabel. What's the matter, Petite? Most critically met. Ah, sir, that one who has followed the game so long and brought the poor hair just under his paws should let a mongrel cur chop in and run away with the puss. If your worship can get out of your allegories, be pleased to tell me in three words what you mean. Plain, plain, sir. Your mistress and mine is going to be married. <laughs> I believe you lie, sir. Your humble servant, sir. Going. 
Come hither, petite. Married, see you? No, sir, tis no matter. I only thought to do you a service. But I shall take care how I confer my favors for the future. Sir, I beg ten thousand pardons. Bowing low. Tis enough, sir. I come to tell you, sir, that Oriana is this moment to be sacrificed, married past redemption. Oh, I understand her. She'll take a husband out of spite to me, and then, out of love to me, she will make him a cuckold. But who is the happy man? A lord, sir. I'm her ladyship's most humble servant. Now must I be a constant attender at my lord's levee, to work my way to my lady's couché. A countess, I presume, sir. A Spanish count, sir, that Mr. Dugard knew abroad, is come to Paris. Saw your mistress yesterday, marries her today, and whips her into Spain tomorrow. Ah, is it so? And must I follow my cuckold over the Pyrenees? Had she married within the precincts of a bidou, I would be the man to lead her to church. But as it happens, I'll forbid the bands. Where is this mighty don? Have a care, sir. He's a rough, cross-grained piece, and there's no tampering with him. Would you apply to Mr. Dugard or the lady herself? Something might be done, for it is in despite to you that the business is carried so hastily. Odd so, sir. Here he comes. I must be gone. Exit. Enter old Mirabel, dressed in a Spanish habit, leading Oriana. Good, my lord. A nobler choice had better suited your lordship's merit. My person, rank, and circumstance expose me as the public theme of raillery, and subject me so to injurious usage, my lord, that I can lay no claim to any part of your regard, except your pity. Breathes he vital air that dares presume with rude behaviour to profane such excellence? Show me the man, and you shall see how my sudden revenge shall fall upon the head of such presumption. Is this thing one? Strutting up to young Mirabel. Sir! Good, my lord. If he, or any he? Pray, my lord, the gentleman's a stranger. Oh, your pardon, sir. But if you had, remember, sir, the lady now is mine. Her injuries are mine. Therefore, sir, you understand me. Come, madam. Leads Oriana to the door. She goes off. Young Mirabel runs to his father and pulls him by the sleeve. Écoute, monsieur le comte. Your business, sir? Bo. Bah! What language is that, sir? Spanish, my lord. What do you mean? This, sir? He trips up his heels. A very concise quarrel, truly. I'll bully him. Trenade, seigneur, give me fair play. Offering to rise. By all means, sir. Takes away his sword. Now, senor, where's that bombast look and fustian face your countship wore just now? Strikes him. The rogue quarrels well, very well. My own son, right. But hold, sirrah, no more jesting. I'm your father, sir, your father. Ah, my father, then by this light I could find in my heart to pay thee. Aside. Is the fellow mad? Why, sure, sir, I hadn't frighted you out of your senses. But you have, sir. Ooh, then I'll beat them into you again. Offers to strike him. Why, rogue! Bob, dear Bob! Don't you know me, child? <laughs> the fellow's downright distracted. Thou miracle of impudence. Wouldst thou make me believe that such a grave gentleman as my father would go masquerading thus? That a person of three score and three would run about in a fool's coat to disgrace himself and family? Why, you impudent villain, do you think I will suffer such an affront to pass upon my honoured father, my worthy father, my dear father? Yes, sir, mention my father but once again, and I'll send your soul to thy grandfather this minute. Offering to stab him. Well, well, I am not your father. Why then, sir? You are the saucy, hectoring Spaniard, and I'll use you accordingly. 
Enter Dugard, Oriana, Maid, and Petite. Dugard runs to young Mirabel, the rest to the old gentleman. Fie, fie, Mirabel. Murder your father. My father? What, is the whole family mad? Give me way, sir, I won't be held. No, nor I neither. Let me be gone, pray. Offering to go. My father? Ay, you dog's face. I am your father, for I have borne as much for thee as your mother ever did. Oh, then this was a trick, it seems. A design. A contrivance. A stratagem. Oh, how my bones ache. Your bones, sirrah. Why yours? Why, sir, had I been beating my own flesh and blood all this while? Oh, madam. To Oriana. I wish your ladyship joy of your new dignity. Here was a contrivance indeed. Pray, sir, don't insult the misfortunes of your own creating. My prudence will be counted cowardice if I stand tamely now. Comes up between young Mirabel and his sister. Well, sir? Well, sir. Do you take me for one of your tenants, sir, that you put on your landlord's face at me? On what presumption, sir, dare you assume thus? Draws. What's that to you, sir? Draws. Help! Help! The lady faints. Oriana falls into her maid's arms. Vapors, vapors! She'll come to herself. It'll be an angry fit, a dram of asafoetida. If jealousy, heart's horn in water. If the mother, burnt feathers. If grief, ratafia. If it be straight stays or corns, there's nothing like a dram of plain brandy. Exit. Hold off, give me air. Oh, my brother, would you preserve my life, endanger not your own? Would you defend my reputation, leave it to itself? Tis a dear vindication that's purchased by the sword. For though our champion proves victorious, yet our honour is wounded. Ay, and your lover may be wounded, that's another thing. But I think you are pretty brisk again, my child. Ay, sir, my indisposition was only a pretense to divert the quarrel. The capricious taste of your sex excuses this artifice in ours. Exit. Come, Mr. Dugard, take courage. There is a way still left to fetch him again. Sir, I'll have no plot that has any relation to Spain. I scorn all artifice whatsoever. My sword shall do her justice. Pretty justice, truly. Suppose you run him through the body. You run her through the heart at the same time. And me through the head. Rot your sword, sir. We'll have plots. Come, Pettit, let's hear. What if she pretended to go into a nunnery, and so bring him about to declare himself? That, I must confess, has a face. A face? A face like an angel, sir. Odds my life, sir, tis the most beautiful plot in Christendom. We'll about it immediately. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Inconstant by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fourth. Scene One. Old Mirabel's House. Enter Old Mirabel and Dugard. The Lady Abbess is my relation, and privy to the plot. Ay, ay, this nunnery will bring him about, I warrant ye. Enter Duetet. Here, where are you all? Oh, Mr. Mirabel, you have done fine things for your posterity, and you, Mr. Dugard, may come to answer this. I come to demand my friend at your hands. Restore him, sir, or... Restore him? What, do you think I have got him in my trunk, or my pocket? Sir, he's mad, and you are the cause on't. That may be, for I was as mad as he when I begot him. Mad, sir? What do you mean? What do you mean, sir, by shutting up your sister yonder to talk like a parrot through a cage? Or a decoy duck, to draw others into the snare? Your son, sir, because she has deserted him, he has forsaken the world, and, in three words, has... 
hanged himself? The very same. Turned friar. You lie, sir. Tis ten times worse. Bob turned friar? Why should the fellow shave his foolish crown when the same razor may cut his throat? If you have any command, or you any interest over him, lose not a minute. He has thrown himself into the next monastery and has ordered me to pay off his servants and discharge his equipage. Let me alone to ferret him out. I'll sacrifice the abbot if he receives him. I'll try whether the spiritual or the natural father has the most right to the child. But, dear captain, what has he done with his estate? Settled it upon the church, sir. The church? Nay, then the devil won't get him out of their clutches. Ten thousand livres a year upon the church? Tis downright sacrilege. Come, gentlemen, all hands to work. For half that sum, one of these monasteries shall protect you a traitor from the law, a rebellious wife from her husband, and a disobedient son from his own father. Exit. But will ye persuade me that he's gone to a monastery? Is your sister gone to the filly's repenties? I tell you, sir, she's not fit for the society of repenting maids. Why so, sir? Because she's neither one nor t'other. She's too old to be a maid and too young to repent. Exit. Dugard after him. Scene two. The inside of a monastery. Enter Oriana in a nun's habit, and Bizarre. I hope, Bizarre, there is no harm in jesting with his religious habit. To me the greatest jest in the habit is taking it in earnest. But I'm reconciled, methinks, to the mortification of a nunnery, because I fancy the habit becomes me. A well-contrived mortification, truly, that makes a woman look ten times handsomer than she did before. Aye, my dear, were there any religion in becoming dress, our sex's devotion were rightly placed, for our toilets would do the work of the altar. We should all be canonized. But don't you think there is a great deal of merit in dedicating a beautiful face and person to the service of religion? Not half so much as devoting them to a pretty fellow. Come, come, mind your business. Mirabel loves you, tis now plain, and hold him to it. Give fresh orders that he shan't see you. We get more by hiding our faces sometimes than by exposing them. A very mask, you see, wets desire. But a pair of keen eyes, through an iron grate, fire double upon them, with view and disguise. But I must be gone upon my affairs. I have brought my captain about again. But why will you trouble yourself with that coxcomb? <laughs> because he is a coxcomb. Had I not better have a lover like him that I can make an ass of than a lover like yours to make a fool of me? Knocking below. A message from Mirabel. I'll lay my life. She runs to the door. <laughs> come hither. Run, thou charming nun. Come hither. What's the news? Runs to her. Don't you see who's below? I see nobody but a friar. Ah, thou poor blind Cupid, a friar. Don't you see a villainous genteel mean under that cloak of hypocrisy? As I live, Mirabel turned friar. I hope in heaven he's not in earnest. In earnest? <laughs> Are you in earnest? Remember what I say. If you would yield to advantage and hold out the attack, to draw him on, keep him off, to be sure. The cunning gamesters never gain too fast, but lose at first to win the more at last. Exit. Enter young Mirabel in a friar's habit. Save you, sister. Your brother, young lady, having a regard for your soul's health, has sent me to prepare you for the sacred habit by confession. My brother's care I own. And to you, sacred sir, I confess that the great crying sin, which I have long indulged and now prepared to expiate, was love. My morning thoughts, my evening prayers, my daily musings, nightly cares, was love. She's downright stark mad in earnest. Death and confusion, I have lost her. You confess your faults, madam, in such moving terms that I could almost be in love with the sin. Take care, sir. Crimes, like virtues, are their own rewards. My chief delight became my only grief. 
he in whose breast I thought my heart secure, turned a robber, and he spoiled the treasure that he kept. Perhaps that treasure he esteemed so much that, like the miser, though afraid to use it, he reserves it safe. No, holy father. Who can be miser in another's wealth that's prodigal of his own? His heart was open, shared to all he knew, and what, alas, must then become of mine? But the same eyes that drew this passion in shall send it out in tears, to which now hear my vow. Young Mirabel, discovering himself. No, my fair angel, here, on my knees, behold the criminal that vows repentance his. Kneels. Ha! No concern upon her. Enter old Mirabel. Where? Where is this counterfeit nun? Madness! Confusion! I'm ruined! What do I hear? Puts on his hood. What did you say, sir? I say she's a counterfeit. And you may be another, for aught I know, sir. I have lost my child by these tricks, sir. What tricks, sir? By a pretended trick, sir. A contrivance to bring my son to reason. And it has made him stark mad. I have lost him, and a thousand pound a year. Young Mirabel, discovering himself. My dear father, how your most humble servant. My dear boy. Runs and kisses him. Welcome, ex inferis, my dear boy. "'Tis all a trick. She's no more a nun than I am. "'No? "'The devil a bit. "'Then kiss me again, my dear dad, for the most happy news. "'And now, most venerable holy sister. "'Kneels. "'Your mercy and your pardon I implore, "'for the offence of asking it before. "'Look ye, my dear counterfeiting nun, take my advice. "'Be a nun in good earnest.' Women make the best nuns always, when they can't do otherwise. Oh, sir, how unhappily have you destroyed what was so near perfection. He is the counterfeit that has deceived you. Ha! Ah, look ye, sir, I recant. She is a nun. Sir, your humble servant. Then I am a friar this moment. Was ever an old fool so bantered by a brace of young ones? Hang you both. You're both counterfeits. And my plot spoiled, that's all. Shame and confusion, love, anger, and disappointment will work my brain to madness. Takes off her habit. Exit. Ay, ay, throw by the rags. They have served a turn for us both, and they shall e'en go off together. Takes off his habit. Exit, throwing away the habit. Scene 3. Old Mirabel's House. Enter Duartet with a letter. Reads, My rudeness was only a proof of your humour, which I have found so agreeable that I own myself penitent and willing to make any reparation upon your first appearance to bizarre. Mirabel swears she loves me, and this confirms it. Then farewell gallantry and welcome revenge. Tis my turn now to be upon the sublime. I'll take her off. I warrant her. Enter Bizar. Well, mistress, do you love me? I hope, sir, you will pardon the modesty of... Of what? Of a dancing devil? Do you love me, I say? Perhaps I... What? Perhaps I do not. Ah, abused again. Death woman, I'll... Hold, hold, sir. I do, do. Confirm it, then, by your obedience... Stand there and ogle me now as if your heart, blood, and soul were like to fly out at your eyes. First, the direct surprise. She looks full upon him. Right. Next, the de yeux par oblique. She gives him the side glance. Right. Now, depart and languish. She turns from him and looks over her shoulder. Very well. Now, sigh. She sighs. Now drop your fan on purpose. She drops her fan. Now take it up again. Come now, confess your faults. Are not you a proud? Uh, say after me. Proud. Impertinent. Impertinent. Uh, ridiculous. Ridiculous. Flirt. Puppy. Zoons, woman, don't provoke me. 
We are alone, and you don't know, but the devil may tempt me to do you a mischief. Ask my pardon immediately. I do, sir. I only mistook the word. Cry, then. Have you got here a handkerchief? Yes, sir. Cry, then, handsomely. Cry like a queen in a tragedy. <laughs> Enter two ladies laughing. <laughs> uh, hell broke loose upon me, and all the furies fluttered about my ears, betrayed again. <laughs> that you are upon my word, my dear captain. <laughs> the Lord deliver me. What? Is this the mighty man with the bull face that comes to frighten ladies? Ah, madam, I'm the best-natured fellow in the world. A man? We're mistaken. A man has manners. The awkward creature is some tinker's troll in a periwig. Come, ladies, let us examine him. They lay hold on him. Examine? The devil you will. I lay my life some great dairy made in man's clothes. They will do it. Look ye, dear Christian women, pray hear me. Will you ever attempt a lady's honour again? If you please to let me get away with my honour, I'll do anything in the world. Will you persuade your friend to marry mine? Oh, yes, to be sure. And will you do the same by me? Burn me if I do, if the coast be clear. Runs out. <laughs> To visit ladies was critical for our diversions. We'll go make an end of our tea. Exeunt. Enter young Mirabel and old Mirabel. Your patience, sir. I tell you, I won't marry. And though you send all the bishops in France to persuade me, I shall never believe their doctrine against their practice. You would compel me to that state which I have heard you curse yourself when my mother and you have battled it for a whole week together. Never but once, you rogue, and that was when she longed for six Flanders mares. Ay, sir, then she was breeding of you, which showed what an expensive dog I should have of you. Enter Petit. Well, Pettit, how is she now? Mad, sir, con pompous. Ay, Mr. Mirabel, you'll believe that I speak truth now, when I confess I have told you hitherto nothing but lies. Our jesting has come to a sad earnest. She's downright distracted. Enter Bizarre. Where is this mighty victor? The great exploit is done. Oh, sir. To the old gentleman. Your wretched ward has found a tender guardian of you. Where her young innocence expected protection, here has she found her ruin. Aye, the fault is mine. For I believe that rogue won't marry, for fear of begetting such another disobedient son as his father did. I have done all I can, madam, and now can do no more than run mad for company. Cries. Enter Dugard with his sword drawn. Away! Revenge! Revenge! Patience! Patience, sir! Old Mirabel holds him. Bob, draw! Patience! The coward's virtue, and the brave's man failing, when thus provoked. Villain! Your sister's frenzy shall excuse your madness. And to show my concern for what she suffers, I'll bear the villain from her brother. Put up your anger with your sword. I have a heart like yours that swells at an affront received, but melts at an injury given. And if the lovely Oriana's grief be such a moving scene, twill find a part within this breast, perhaps as tender as a brother's. To prove that soft compassion for her grief, endeavor to remove it. There, there, behold an object that's infective. I cannot view her, but I am as mad as she. Enter Oriana, held by two maids who put her in a chair. A sister that my dying parents left with their last words and blessing to my care. Goes to her. Sister. Dearest sister. Ay, poor child, poor child. Do you know me? You. You are Amadie de Gaulle, sir. 
Oh, oh, my heart! Were you never in love, fair lady? And do you never dream of flowers and gardens? I dream of walking fires and tall gigantic sights. Take heed, it comes now. What's that? Pray stand away. I have seen that face, sure. How light my head is. What piercing charms has beauty even in madness? I cannot, for I must be up to go to church, and I must dress me, put on my new gown, and be so fine to meet my love. Hey ho! Will not you tell me where my heart lies buried? My very soul's touched. Your hand, my fair. How soft and gentle you feel. I'll tell you your fortune, friend. How she stares upon me. You have a flattering face, but tis a fine one. I warrant you have five hundred mistresses. Ay, to be sure, a mistress for every guinea in his pocket. Will you pray for me? I shall die tomorrow, and will you ring my passing bell? Do you know me, injured creature? No, but you shall be my intimate acquaintance in the grave. Weeps. Oh, tears. I must believe you. Sure, there's a kind of sympathy in madness. For even I, obdurate as I am, do feel my soul so tossed with storms of passion that, that I could cry for help as well as ye. Wipes his eyes. What? Have you lost your lover? No, you mock me. I'll go home and pray. Stay, my fair innocence, and hear me own my love so loud that I may call your senses to their place, restore them to their charming happy functions, and reinstate myself into your favour. Let her alone, sir. Tis all too late. She trembles. Hold her. Her fits grow stronger by her talking. Don't trouble her. She don't know you, sir. Not know him? What then? She loves to see him for all that? Enter Duetet. Where are you all? What the devil? Melancholy and I here? Are ye sad, and such a ridiculous subject, such a very good jest among you as I am? Away with this impertinence! This is no place for bagatelle. I have murdered my honour, destroyed a lady, and my desire of reparation has come at length too late. See there! What ails her? Alas, she's mad. Med? Does wonder at that. By this light, they're also. They're cozening mad. They're brawling mad. They're proud mad. I just now came from a whole world of mad women that had almost... Uh, what? Is she dead? Dead? Heavens forbid. Heavens further it, for till they be as cold as a key, there's no trusting them. You're never sure that a woman's in earnest till she's nailed in her coffin. Shall I talk to her? Are you mad, mistress? What's that to you, sir? Udens, madam, are you there? Runs off. Away, thou wild buffoon! How poor and mean this humour now appears! His folly is in my own, I here disclaim. This lady's frenzy has restored my senses, and was well, she perfect now, as once she was, before you all I speak it, she would be mine, and as she is. My tears and prayers shall wed her. How happy had this declaration been some hours ago. Sir, she beckons to you and waves us to go off. Come, come, let's leave them. Exeunt all but young Mirabel and Oriana. Oh, sir! Speak, my charming angel, if your dear senses have regained their order. Speak fair and bless me with the news. First... Let me bless the cunning of my sex, that happy, counterfeited frenzy that has restored my poor labouring breast the dearest, best beloved of men. Tune all ye spheres, your instruments of joy, and carry round your spacious orbs the happy sound of Oriana's health. Her soul, whose harmony was next to yours, is now in tune again. The counterfeiting fairest played the fool. She was so mad to counterfeit for me, I was so mad upon my liberty, but now we both are well, and both are free. How, sir? Free? Is there, my dear bedlamite? What? Marry a lunatic? Look here, my dear, you have counterfeited madness so very well this bout that she'll be apt to play the fool all your life long. Here, gentlemen. Monster, you would disgrace me. 
On my faith, but I will. Here, come in, gentlemen. A miracle, a miracle. The woman is dispossessed. The devil's vanished. Enter old Mirabel and Dugard. Bless us. Was she possessed? With the worst of demons, sir. A marriage devil, a horrid devil. Mr. Dugard, don't be surprised. I promised my endeavours to cure your sister. No mad doctor in Christendom could have done it more effectually. Take her into your charge, and have a care she don't relapse. If she should, employ me not again, for I am no more infallible than others of the faculty. I do cure sometimes. Your remedy, most barbarous man, will prove the greatest poison to my health. For though my former frenzy was but counterfeit, I now shall run into a real madness. Exit. Old Mirabel after. What a dangerous precipice have I escaped. Was not I just now upon the brink of destruction? Enter Dwartet. Oh, my friend, let me run into thy bosom. No lark escaped from the devouring pounces of a hawk, quakes with more dismal apprehension. The matter, man. Marriage. Hagging. I was just at the gallow's foot, the running noose about my neck, the cart wheeling from me. Oh, I shan't be myself this month again. Did not I tell you so? They're all alike, saints or devils. Aye, aye. There's no living here with security. This house is so full of stratagem and design that I must abroad again. With all my heart, I'll bear thee company, my lad. I'll meet you at the play, and we'll set out for Italy tomorrow morning. A match. I'll go pay my compliment of leave to my father presently. I'm afraid he'll stop you. What? Pretend to command over me, after his settlement of a thousand pound a year upon me? No, no, he has passed away his authority with the conveyance. The will of the living father is chiefly obeyed for the sake of the dying one. Dependence, even a father's sway, secures, for, though the son rebels, the heir is yours. Exeunt severally. End of Act Four. Act Five of The Inconstant by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fifth, Scene One The Street Before the Playhouse. Mirabel and Dortet as coming from the play. How do you like this play? Ma, I like the company. The lady. The rich beauty in the front box had my attention. These impudent poets bring the ladies together to support them, and to kill everybody else. For death upon the stage the ladies cry, but never mind us that in the audience die. The poet's hero should not move their pain, but they should weep for those their eyes have slain. Hoity tighty, did Phyllis inspire you with all this? Ten times more. The playhouse is the element of poetry, because the region of beauty. The ladies, methinks, have a more inspiring, triumphant air in the boxes than anywhere else. And they sit, commanding on their thrones, with all their subject slaves about them. Their best clothes, best looks, shining jewels, sparkling eyes. The treasure of the world in a ring. I could wish that my whole life long were the first night of a new play. The fellow has quite forgot this journey. Have you bespoke post-horses? Grant me but three days, dear captain. One to discover the lady, one to unfold myself, and one to make me happy, and that I'm yours to the world's end. Hadst thou the impudence to promise thyself a lady of her figure and quality in so short a time? Yes, sir. I have a confident address, no disagreeable person, and five hundred Louis d'or in my pocket. Five hundred Louis doors? You went mad. I tell you, she's worth five thousand. One of her black, brilliant eyes is worth a diamond as big as her head. But you have owned to me that, abating Oriana's pretension to marriage, you loved her passionately. Then how could you wander at this rate? I longed for a partridge the other day off the king's plate, but do you think because I could not have it I must eat nothing? 
Enter Oriana in boy's clothes with a letter. Is your name Mirabel, sir? Yes, sir. A letter from your uncle in Picardy. Gives the letter. Young Mirabel reads. The bearer is the son of a Protestant gentleman who, flying for his religion, left me the charge of this youth. A pretty boy. He's fond of some handsome service that may afford him opportunity of improvement. Your care of him will oblige. Yours. Hast a mind to travel, child? Tis my desire, sir. I should be pleased to serve a traveller in any capacity. A hopeful inclination. You shall along with me into Italy as my page. Noise without. Too handsome. The play's done and some of the ladies come this way. La Morse without, with her train borne up by a page. Deltet, the very dear identical she. And what then? Why, tis she. And what then, sir? Then? To Oriana. Why, look ye, Sarah, the first piece of service I put upon you is to follow that lady's coach and bring me word where she lives. I don't know the town, sir, and I'm afraid of losing myself. Pshaw! Enter La Morse and Page. Page, what's become of all my people? I can't tell, ma'am. I can see no sign of your ladyship's coach. That fellow has got into his old pranks, and fallen drunk somewhere. None of the footmen there? Not one, madam. These servants are the plague of our lives. What shall I do? By all my hopes, fortune pimps for me. Now, Deltet, for a piece of gallantry. Why, you won't, sure? Won't, brute. Let not your servants neglect, madam, put your ladyship to any inconvenience, for you can't be disappointed of an equipage whilst mine waits below, and would you honour the master so far, he would be proud to pay his attendance. Aye, to be sure. Sir, I won't presume to be troublesome, for my habitation is a great way off. Very true, madam, and he's a little engaged. Besides, madam, a hackney coach will do as well, madam. Rude beast, be quiet. The farther from home, madam, the more occasion you have for a guard. Pray, madam. Lard, sir. He seems to press. She to decline it, in dumb show. Ah, the devil's in his impudence. Now he wheedles, she smiles, he flatters, she simpers, he swears, she believes. He's a rogue and she's a... W in a moment. Without there, my coach. Deltet, wish me joy. Hands the lady out. Wish you were... Here, you little Picard, go follow your master and he'll lead you... Whither, sir? To the academy, child. Tis the fashion with men of quality to teach their pages their exercises. Go. Won't you go with him too, sir? That woman may do him some harm. I don't like her. Why, how now, Mr. Page? Do you start up to give laws of a sudden? Do you pretend to rise at court and disapprove the pleasure of your betters? Look ye, Sarah, if ever you would rise by a great man, be sure to be with him in his little actions, and, as a step to your advancement, follow your master immediately, and make it your hope that he goes to a bagnio. Heavens forbid! Exit. Now would I sooner take a cart in company of the hangman than a coach with that woman? What a strange antipathy have I taken against these creatures. A woman, to me, is a version upon a version. A cheese, a cat, a breast of mutton, the squalling of children, the grinding of knives, and the snuff of a candle. Scene 2. Lamorse's Lodgings. Enter Mirabel and Lamorse. To convince me, sir, that your service was something more than good breeding, please to lay out an hour of your company upon my desire as you have already upon my necessity. Your desire, madam, has only prevented my request. My hours. Make them yours, madam. Eleven, twelve, one, two, three, and all that belong to those happy minutes. But I must trouble you, sir, to dismiss your retinue, because an equipage at my door, at this time of night, will not be consistent with my reputation. By all means, madam. All but one little boy. Here, page. Enter Oriana. Order my coach and servants home, and do you stay. 
"'Tis a foolish country boy that knows nothing but innocence." "'Innocence, sir! I should be sorry if you made any sinister constructions of my freedom." "'Oh, madam, I must not pretend to remark upon anybody's freedom, having so entirely forfeited my own." "'Well, sir, it were convenient towards our easy correspondence that we entered into a free confidence of each other by a mutual declaration of what we are and what we think of one another. Now, sir, what are you?' "'In three words, madam. I am a gentleman, and have five hundred pounds in my pocket." "'And your name is?' "'Mustafa. Now, madam, the inventory of your fortunes?' "'My name is Lamours, my birth noble. I was married young to a proud, rude, sullen, impetuous fellow. The husband spoiled the gentleman. Crying ruined my face, till at last I took heart, leaped out of a window, got away to my friends, sued my tyrant, and recovered my fortune.' I lived from fifteen to twenty to please a husband. From twenty to forty, I am resolved to please myself. And from thence upwards, I'll humour the world. <laughs> oh, I rejoice in your good fortune with all my heart. Oh, now I think on it, Mr. Mustafa. You have got the finest ring there. I could scarcely believe it right. Pray let me see it. Hmm. Yes, madam. Tis, uh, tis right. But, but... But, but, but it was given me by my mother. An old family ring, madam. An old-fashioned family ring. Aye, sir. If you can entertain yourself for a moment, I'll wait on you immediately. Certainly the stars have been in a strange, intriguing humour when I was born. I this night should I have had a pride in my arms, and that I should like well enough. But what should I have tomorrow night? The same. And what next? The same. And what next night? The same. Soup for breakfast, soup for dinner, soup for supper, and soup for breakfast again. But here's variety. I love the fair who freely gives her heart. That's mine by ties of nature, not of art. Who boldly owns whatever her thoughts indite, and is too modest for a hypocrite. Lamors appears at the door. She comes, she comes. As he runs towards her, four bravos step in before her. He starts back. Huh? Who? Huh. Bitch! Murdered! Murdered, to be sure! The cursed strumpet! To make me send away my servants. Nobody near me! These cutthroats always make sure work. What shall I do? I have but one way. Are these gentlemen your relations, madam? Yes, sir. Gentlemen, your most humble servant. Sir, your most faithful. Your sir, with all my heart. Your most obedient. Come, gentlemen. Salutes all around. Please to sit. No ceremony. Next the lady, pray, sir. Well, sir, and how do you like my friends? They all sit. Oh, madam, the most finished gentleman. I was never more happy in good company in my life. I suppose, sir, you have travelled? Yes, sir. Which way, may I presume? In a western barge, sir. <laughs> Very pretty, facetious, pretty gentleman. <laughs> sir, you have got the prettiest ring upon your finger there. Ah, madam, tis at your service with all my heart. Offering the ring. By no means, sir, a family ring. Takes it. No matter, madam. Aside. Seven hundred pound by this light. Pray, sir, what's a clock? Hmm? Sir, I have left my watch at home. I thought I saw the string of it just now. Oh, it's my life, sir, I beg your pardon. Oh, here it is. But it don't go. Putting it up. Oh, dear sir, an English watch. Tompions, I presume? Do you like it, madam? No ceremony. She's at your service with all my heart and soul. Aside. Tompions? Hang ye. But, sir, above all things, I admire the fashion and make of your sword hilt. I'm mighty glad you like it, sir. Will you part with it, sir? Sir, I won't sell it. Not sell it? 
sir? No, gentlemen, but I'll bestow it with all my heart. Offering it. Oh, sir, we shall rob you. Aside. That you do, I'll be sworn. I have another at home. Pray, sir. Gentlemen, you're too modest. Have I anything else that you fancy? Sir, will you do me a favor? To the first bravo. I am extremely in love with that hat which you wear. Will you do me the favor to change with me? Look ye, sir. This is a family hat, and I would not part with it. But if you like it... They change hats. Aside. I want but a handsome pretense to quarrel with him. Some wine. Sir, your good health. Pulls Mirabel by the nose. Oh, sir, your most humble servant. A pleasant frolic enough to drink a man's health and pull him by the nose. <laughs> oh, the pleasantest, pretty humoured gentleman. Help the gentleman to a glass. Mirabel drinks. How'd you like the wine, sir? Very good of the kind, sir. But I tell you what, I find we're all inclined to be frolicsome. The cat, for my own part, I was never more disposed to be merry. Let's make a night on't, ha? Huh? Because the wine is pretty, but I have such burgundy at home. Look ye, gentlemen, let me send for half a dozen flasks of my burgundy. I defy France to match it. It will make us all life, all air. Pray, gentlemen. Eh? Shall us have his burgundy? Yes, Faith, we'll have all we can. Here, call up the gentleman's servant. Exit footman. What think you, Lamors? Yes, yes. Your servant is a foolish country boy, sir. He understands nothing but innocence. Aye, aye, madam. Here, page. Enter Oriana. Take this key and go to my butler. Order him to send half a dozen flasks of the red burgundy, marked a thousand. And be sure you make haste. I long to entertain my friends here. My very good friends. Ah, oh, dear sir. Ah, oh, dear sir. Ah, oh, dear, oh, dear sir. sir. Here, child, take a glass of wine. Your master and I have changed hats, honey, in a frolic. Where had you this pretty boy, honest Mustafa? Mustafa! Out of Picardy. This is the first errand he has made for me, and if he does it right, I will encourage him. The red burgundy, sir. The red, marked a thousand, and be sure you make haste. I shall, sir. Exit. Sir, you were pleased to like my hats. Have you any fancy for my coat? Look ye, sir. It has served a great many honest gentlemen very faithfully. The insolence of these dogs is beyond their cruelty. Your melancholy, sir. Only concern, madam, that I should have no servant here but this little boy. He'll make some confounded blunder. I'll lay my life on't. I will not be disappointed in my wine for the universe. He'll do well enough, sir. But supper's ready. Will you please to eat a bit, sir? Oh, madam, I never had a better stomach in my life. Come, then. We have nothing but a plate of soup. Aside. Ah, oh, the marriage soup I could dispense with now. Exit, handing the lady. Shall we dispatch him? To be sure. I think he knows me. Aye, aye. Dead men tell no tales. I hadn't the confidence to look a man in the face after I had done him an injury. Therefore, we'll murder him. Exeunt. Scene three. Old Mirabel's house. Enter Duartet. My friend has forsaken me. I have abandoned my mistress. My time lies heavy upon my hands, and my money burns in my pocket. But now I think on't, my myrmidons are upon duty tonight. I'll fairly stroll down to the guard, and nod away the night with my honest lieutenant over a flask of wine, a story, and a pipe of tobacco. Going off, Bizarre meets him. Who comes there? Stand. Hey, day, now she's turned dragoon. Look ye, sir, I'm told you intend to travel again. 
I design to wait on you as far as Italy. Then I'll travel into Wales. Wales? What country is that? The land of mountains, child, where you're never out of the way, cause there's no such thing as a high road. Rather always in a high road, because you travel all upon hills. But be it as it will, I'll jog along with you. But we intend to sail to the East Indies. East or west, tis all one to me. I'm tight and light, and the fitter for sailing. But suppose we take through Germany and drink hard. Suppose I take through Germany and drink harder than you. Suppose I go to a bawdy house. <laughs> suppose I show you the way. It's death, woman. Will you go to the guard with me and smoke a pipe? Allons donc. The devil's in the woman. Suppose I hang myself. There I'll leave you. And a happy riddance. The gallows is welcome. Hold, hold, sir. Catches him by the arm, going. One word before we part. Let me go, madam, or I shall think that you're a man, and perhaps may examine you. Stir if you dare. I have still spirits to attend me, and can raise such a muster of fairies as shall punish you to death. Come, sir, stand there now, and ogle me. He frowns upon her. Now a languishing sigh. He groans. Now run, and take my fan. Faster. He runs, and takes it up. Now play with it handsomely. Aye, aye. He tears it all in pieces. Hold, hold, dear humorous coxcomb. Captain, spare my fan, and I'll... Why, you rude, inhuman monster, don't you expect to pay for this? Yes, madam, there's twelve pence, for that is the price on't. Sir, it cost a guinea. Well, madam, you shall have the sticks again. Throws them to her and exit. <laughs> Ridiculous, below my concern. I must follow him, however, to know if he can give me any news of Oriana. Exit. Scene 4. Lamorse's Lodgings. Enter young Mirabel. Bloody hellhounds! I overheard you. Was not I two hours ago the happy, gay, rejoicing Mirabel? How did I plume my hopes in a fair coming prospect of a long scene of years? Life courted me with all the charms of vigor, youth, and fortune. To be torn away from all my promised joys is more than death. The manner, too, by villains. Oh, my Oriana, this very moment might have blessed me in thy arms. And my poor boy, the innocent boy, confusion. But hush, they come. I must dissemble still. And no news of my wine, gentlemen. Enter the four bravos. No, sir. I believe your country booby has lost himself, and we can wait no longer for it. True, sir, you're a pleasant gentleman, but I suppose you understand our business. Sir, I may go near to guess at your employments. You, sir, are a lawyer, I presume. You a physician, you a scrivener, and you a stock jobber. Aside. Oh, cutthroat sea gad. Sir, I am a broken officer. I was cashiered at the head of the army for a cowed. So I took up the tree to murder, to retrieve the reputation of my courage. I am a soldier, too, and would serve my king. But I don't like the quarrel, and I have more honor than to fight in a bad cause. I was bred a gentleman, and have no estate, but I must have my haw and my bottle, through the prejudice of education. I am a ruffian, too. By the prejudice of education, I was born a butcher. In short, sir, if your wine had come, we might have trifled a little longer. Come, sir, which sword will you fall by? Mine, sir? Draws. Or mine? Draws. Or mine? Draws. 
or mine. Draws. I scorn to beg my life, but to be butchered thus? Knocking. Oh, there's the wine. This moment for my life or death. Enter Oriana. Lost. Forever lost. Where's the wine, child? Coming up, sir. Stamps. Enter Dortet with his sword drawn, and six of the Grand Musketeers with their pieces presented. The ruffians drop their swords. Oriana goes off. The wine! The wine! The wine! Youth! Pleasure! Fortune! Days and years! Are now my own again! Oh, my dear friends! Did not I tell you this wine would make me merry? Dear Captain, these gentlemen are the best-natured, facetious, witty creatures that ever you knew. Enter La Morse. Is the wine come, sir? Oh, yes, madam! The wine is come! See there! Pointing to the soldiers. Your ladyship has got a very fine ring upon your finger. Sir, tis at your service. Oh, is it so? Thou dear seven hundred pound, thou art welcome home again with all my heart. That's my life, madam. You have got the finest built watch there. Tompions, I presume. Sir, you may wear it. Oh, madam, by no means tis too much. Rob you of all. Taking it from her. Good dear time, thou art a precious thing. I'm glad I have achieved thee. Putting it up. What, my friends neglected all this while? Gentlemen, you'll pardon my complacence to the lady. How now? Is it civil to be so out of humour at my entertainment, and I so pleased with yours? Captain, you are surprised at all this. But we're in our frolics, you must know. There's some wine here. Enter servant with wine. Come, Captain, this worthy gentleman's health. Tweaks the first bravo by the nose. He roars. But now, where? Where's my dear deliverer? My boy, my charming boy. I hope some of our crew below stairs have dispatched him. Villain, what sayest thou? Dispatched? I'll have you all tortured, racked, torn to pieces alive if you have touched my boy. Here, page, page, page. Runs out. Here, gentlemen, be sure you secure those fellows. Yes, sir, we know you and your guard will be very civil to us. Take them to justice. The guards carry off the bravos. Now for you, madam. He, he, he. I'm so pleased to think that I shall be revenged on one woman before I die. Well, Mrs. Snapdragon, which of these honourable gentlemen is so happy to call you wife? Sir, she should have been mine tonight, cause Sam Prey here had her last night. Sir, she's very true to us all four. Enter old Mirabel, Dugard, and Bizarre. Robin, Robin, where's Bob? Where's my boy? What, is this the lady? A pretty creature in faith. Harky, child, because my son was so civil as to oblige you with a coach, I'll treat you with a cart, indeed I will. Ay, hey, madam, and you shall have a swinging equipage. Three or four thousand footmen at your heels, at least. No less becomes her quality. Ah, the monster. Monster? Aye, you're all a little monstrous, let me tell you. Enter young Mirabel. Ah, my dear Bob, art thou safe, man? No, no, sir, I am ruined. The savour of my life is lost. No, he came and brought us the news. But where is he? Enter Oriana. Ha! Runs and embraces her. My dear preserver, what shall I do to recompense your trust? Father, friends, gentlemen, behold the youth that has relieved me from the most ignominious death. Command me, child, before you all, before my late, so kind, indulgent stars, I swear to grant whatever you ask. To the same stars, indulgent now to me, I will appeal as to the justice of my claim. I shall demand but what was mine before, the just performance of your contract to Oriana. Discovering herself. 
Oriana. 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 In this disguise, I resolved to follow you abroad, counterfeited that letter that brought me into your service. And so, by the strange turn of fate, I became the instrument of your preservation. Few common servants would have had such cunning. My love inspired me with the meaning of your message, because my concern for your safety made me suspect your company. Mewbell, you're caught. Caught? I scorn the thought of imposition. Caught? <laughs> no, tis my voluntary act. This was no human stratagem, but by my providential stars. Designed to show the dangers wandering youth incurs for the pursuit of an unlawful love, to plunge me headlong in the snares of vice, and then to free me by the hands of virtue. Here, on my knees, I humbly beg my fair preserver's pardon. My thanks are needless, for myself I owe. And now, forever, do protest me yours. Tall Alderdal! Kiss me, daughter. No, you shall kiss me first. To La Morse. For you're the cause, aunt. Well, Bizarre, what say you to the captain? I like the beast well enough, but I don't understand his paces so well as to venture him in a strange road. But marriage is so beaten a path that you can't go wrong. Aye, <laughs> tis so beaten that the way is spoiled. There is but one thing should make me thy husband. I could marry thee to-day for the privilege of beating thee to-morrow. Come, come, you may agree for all this. Mr. Degard, are not you pleased with this? So pleased that, if I thought it might secure your son's affection to my sister, I would double her fortune. Fortune? Has she not given me mine, my life, estate, my all, and what is more, her virtuous self? Behold the foil, pointing to Lamorse, that sets this brightness off, to Oriana. Here view the pride, to Oriana. And scandal of the sex, what liberty can be so tempting there, to Lamorse, as a soft, virtuous. Amorous bondage, here. To Oriana. The End End of Act 5 End of The Inconstant by George Farquhar